Schooner, Epson. So don't. Mr. Cole. Present. Mr. Matt, Epson. Ms. Palestrini. Here. Mr. Robinson. Present. Okay. Now, um, I do need a motion to accept electronic attendance for Mr. Kelly, who looks like he's joined. Um, I'll entertain a motion to accept the electronic attendance of Mr. Uh, Aaron Kelly, as trustee for the village. So moved. Second. Uh, questions, comments? I was hoping there'd be a long pause. Uh, <laughs> sweat. <laughs> I'm asking which to that's, that's the. I, I think uh, I think we could just do all in favor. Yes. Because it's not like it's not electronic yet. Um, just take the roll call, please. I saw the look on his face. Mr. Cove. Yes. Mr. Robinson. Yes. Ms. Palestrini. Aye. Passes three, Welcome to the meeting, Trustee Kelly. Thank you. Just as a note, there's no video. It's better that way. I look better. With <laughs> <the camera. laughs> um, all right, everyone. So, uh, do we have anyone signed up to speak this evening? Yeah. Let's do the pledge of allegiance. Okay, first. awesome. Let's do the pledge. <laughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. As mentioned, there's no one signed up to speak. So before you, you have the meeting minutes for February 1st, 2024. Please review them at this time. There is a couple of places where instead of it saying roll call, it was all call vote. That just needs to be updated. Um, no, some of these, some of these, they're not roll calls. They're all calls? Yeah, so that if you. If oh, you, is that when we do? That's when we do all in favor. Okay, then versus, never mind. Yeah, before when it was all electronic, where we had electronic attendance all the time, we had to do roll call all the time, and now that we're back, now we can do. That's all call. I've just right. never seen all call. Um, and number nine, uh, under accounts payable, Custy Kelly moved to table. Um, we just have to delete to approve. Okay. Any other changes? H our uh, number 12. Our chiefs can announce that they have an attentive job offer. I'm thinking it's pending job offer. Or a tentative. A tentative. <laughs> Although they could have been attentive. <laughs> they could be. Yeah. <laughs> That's all. Okay. Any other changes tonight? I'll entertain a motion to approve the minutes with the changes presented by Trustee Palestrini. Second. Questions, comments, concerns? Roll call vote, please. Uh, Mr. Mr. Kelly? Aye. Mr. Cole? Aye. Mr. Palestrini? Aye. Mr. Robinson? Aye. Motion, yes. All right, up next on our agenda, we have the promotion swearing in of Officer John Rupo to the uh, the position of sergeant. So um, before you, um, I, I invite you all to welcome Officer John Rupo, who we will be promoting to sergeant tonight. Officer Rupo is a Hampshire resident and has worked for the Hampshire Police Department for the last two and a half years as a night shift officer, bicycle patrol officer, and he is our police department representative to the King County Multi-Jurisdictional Honor Guard. Officer Rupo came to the Hampshire Police Department in 2021 after a 20-year career with the Rosemont Public Safety Department, where he served in, in cross-trained roles in law enforcement, fire protection, and emergency medical services. <laughs> Officer Rupo is a United States Navy veteran who served on the USS Iowa. Officer Rupo graduated from the Notre Dame High School for Boys in Niles and attended the University of Illinois Chicago. Officer Rupo is joined tonight by his wife, Caroline, parents, Alan, Teresa, sister-in-law, Margie, and brother, Abe. Officer Rupo, please come forward. Support the Constitution of the United States. I will support the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of Illinois. The Constitution of the State of Illinois 
and the laws and ordinances of the village of Hampshire. And the laws and ordinances of the village of Hampshire. And that I will faithfully discharge the duties, and I will faithfully discharge the duties of the office of sergeant of the Hampshire Police Department. Of the office of sergeant of the Hampshire Police Department, according to the best of my ability. According to the best of my ability. <laughs> No, no, we, so there's like so much room back there. <laughs> Who's going to pin the badge on you tonight? My beautiful wife, Carrie. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. Only hurts for the It's life. thick material. So that four more time. <laughs> I hate that word. Now we invite the family and the police officers in the room to take a picture with Sergeant Rudolph. You guys are the ones with all the bad. And push closer to each other. That's good. There. Think like you like each other. <laughs> <laughs> One more. All right, we're good. Any family that wants to come up? She can. Because she's going to take a picture of you. She's going to take a picture of you. Thank you. Thank you. You know what? We can't do it the second time. So we can record it. Notice she wants to take a picture of you that one. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Again, thank you very much for coming. Anybody that came for this train that doesn't want to stay for the rest of this, now's your chance to run. Thank you for coming tonight. Okay, well, thank you for having us. Well, at the same time, I said, well, I think I'm going to get to the Okay, everyone. Um, next, we have the village manager's report. Good evening, Mr. Head. Yes, good evening. Now we would ask you, ask you to discuss and possibly to act. On an ordinance approving text amendments to chapter two, police regulations and municipal code regarding noise and nuisance regulations. Uh, you have before you an agenda set one from the uh, prior meeting from Chief Pan. I believe um, Attorney Kinselli handed out the uh, door tonight. So if you're comfortable with what we've done, you can take an action. If you're not, you can post on the So, um, there were some changes that were proposed at the sound ordinance. Um, it seems that they've been made. Now the board, I hope, let's address this most of the board's concern. The biggest one was snowblowers, refuse, uh, sale of loud vehicles and equipment, and then modernize some of the language within the ordinance, specifically pertaining to phonographs and intercom systems and eight track players and <laughs> mimeographs and that kind of thing. Controllers. <laughs> Um, that is all Mr. Mayor, on page four, um, two dash twenty five dash five miscellaneous noise sources. Sure. Um, the last sentence or the last part of it: If such uh, equipment is audible from any adjacent property used for residential hospital purposes, um, within uh, within six hundred feet was my concern. If I stand at a lot line, is that where the six hundred starts? It would be indoors, correct? Between 10 and 7, within 600 feet of any building used for residential, from any adjacent property used for residential. So it just. It says, or indoors, if such quick. It says, uh, or or indoors, if such is audible from adjacent property. I thought that we had talked, and I, I think that the indoors wasn't there before. I thought we had talked about being able to hear it inside your home. Because there was a big concern that we had had, so maybe you could walk us through the language, Mr. Roselli. The way this reads is, it's not from the lot line; it's from any building used for so basically any home, not like the lot line. The inside, because that was a concern for Trustee Kelly, as I recall, where he was listening to books on tape with his festoon lights on the patio, and was concerned that his neighbor could hear that from their backyard and call the police on him. Okay. If I could then, and that's fine. I understand that. Um, we've listed five different things down there. And so that my thought was, is so we don't have to come back and deal with any of the other ones. Could we add in any other electronic device that emits sound? I have absolutely no problem with that. Uh, is that too vague? That's the point. <laughs> that, is, that is the point. Right? <laughs> yeah. I think that I yeah. think that rather than doing one through five like that, I think if you do any device or maybe you could put six, I don't know, however you want to do it, but that makes sense to me. You want to add six and we'll add six. We'll add six. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I, I had a, a question about this, and I've read this a few times, but admittedly, I kind of had a whirlwind day. So let's say that there's like emergency circumstances within the village, right, where we have lost power for days let's say hopefully it never happens but then residents start setting up generators you know at that time if there was that type of emergency i'd imagine that the village president or the board could declare an emergency and therefore this ordinance wouldn't be in effect for that type of situation correct you're correct oh sorry 
Or was it true? Was <laughs> yeah, or, no, I was, you know, I was checking to see if there was uh, that was a drop. Or for, or for that matter, like during a snowstorm or something like that, if we have a resident that might be on oxygen or something, and so one of the first things they do is fire up their generator. That's correct. Is we wouldn't declare an emergency for that. But they, if there's a loss of power or extenuating circumstances, is that something that within this ordinance? I mean, I, I would I would imagine if your neighbor doesn't have power and you don't have power and your neighbor is trying to keep their oxygen machine going. You're going to be a pretty bad neighbor. Yeah. Your no, neighbor was getting oxygen. No, I, I understand. But, but these are the things yeah. that we think about here, right? Because those are unfortunately sometimes the phone calls that we get. And yes, it would, I, let's start with the beginning. Um, any emergency in the declaration thereof would supersede and mitigate anything that would be imposed by this one. And so if an officer is called in that situation and there's, I'm running my generator to heat the house or I'm running my generator, that would be classified as an emergency type situation, right? That would, that, that to me would be a dollar. Some people have four and a dot, you plug it in. <laughs> I think just I'm running my generator. I mean, it's just an emergency. I would think so. I, I'm just saying, I I don't want to get too far into the weeds. And if we're comfortable moving forward with this, because there's discretion there, there's discretion from the police officer. Sure. And if you look under nuisance, noises, nuisance, noises, excuse me, um, I believe that that would be where it fall under. It would be unlawful. It shall be unlawful to cause or create any unnecessary, unusual noise at any time, which unreasonably annoys, injures, or endangers the comfort or pros, unless such noise is necessary for the protection or preservation of property or of health, safety, or life of some person. Good enough so for me. To me, that that's the exception. Yep. Good enough for me. You guys comfortable moving forward with this? I think it looks good. I thank you guys for all your hard work with that. So we are going to, what was the section I apologize? Trustee Fowler Street was 25. Not yet, 2-25-5. Yeah, We're going to add number six, and it's going to be any electronic. And device. any other electronic device that miss something. Okay, so that's the only change we're proposing tonight. Are you guys comfortable voting on, uh, voting on this with that? Yeah. Trustee Kelly, I'm calling on you specifically because you're electronic. I have, you have. Yeah, I have two two points or two questions. One is on that same section that Trustee Palestrini was just speaking to, where it says 600 feet of any building used for residential or hospital purposes or indoors if such equipment is audible from an adjacent property used for residential or hospital purposes. So we added indoors, but we're saying basically, and I just want to make sure my, my understanding of this is correctly, if you are listening to um, any of these equipment from indoors, indoor, whatever that building is, and it can be audible from an adjacent property okay. used for residential or hospital purposes, then it's in violation of this ordinance. And I think that's a little backwards from what we were talking about. What we were talking about is if it was audible indoors of the adjacent properties, and this makes it look like the way it's worded that the the sound is being emitted from indoor indoors of a building and is audible to a property, an adjacent property. If we added the word indoors to the second qualifying clause used for Indoors, if such equipment is audible indoors from any adjacent property or used for residential or hospital. Well, I, I, I think, think we moved. Sense. I think we moved indoors to the wrong section, or to the wrong part of the sentence. I think it's we're talking about outdoor sound, and then this should be that it's uh, it can be heard indoors at an adjacent property. Within 600 feet, or it can be audible from indoors of an adjacent property. So let's strike indoors there. We'll move it from between from any, it'll read from any indoor adjacent property. Indoor. Well, that's still not a it's great indoors one. Indoors from any. In audible from audible indoors person. from any adjacent property. So between that's audible and from is where indoors yes. should be. Mm -hmm. Uh, the second piece is if we're talking about 600 feet, when we scroll down uh, to page 13 of the packet, I think it's page 13, 
um, with exemptions under 22-25-8E, where it says village authorized events, including firework displays, concerts, and parades. Is my understanding correct then? Because there are almost all businesses when I did the distance in Google Maps are within 600 feet of a residence, <laughs> except for some in the industrial parks. Um, is it my understanding then that any outdoor concerts um, would be, uh, or any of these would need village authorization for each of those to ensure that they are not within violation of this? So like a parking lot party. For example, if, our, for example, if uh, Newman's is having an outdoor ban, they need to get village authorization and I would assume we'd have a form so it's on file that they had authorization or there'd be an application, but they, because it's an outdoor, um, an outdoor concert event, whatever they want to call it, because there's a band playing outdoors and they are within 600 feet, they would have to fill something out with the village, apply for it and be approved to be able to have that, correct? Yeah, well, that section, if you read it, 225-8 does not apply to the following are exempt from the regulations in this section, and it starts with dash six and dash seven. Okay, all right. So then to that point, dash five means that any of those businesses cannot have any of those things going on outdoors. Uh, until, uh, after 10 p.m. Correct. And so that Newman's, Newman's would and, need to And that, that includes Coon Creek Days. No, because that would be a village authorized event. That doesn't, as the village attorney just pointed out, 2-25-5 is not included in what can be exempt from noise regulations. Can you put a section there exempt? Uh, that's why we have the indoor. I mean, that's why we have the indoor in the beginning because it's not indoor. But we can put it in and say that it's exempt. Um, well, I mean, the, neither neither is a band playing at Newman's. That's outdoors as well. But it would. Are we saying that that wouldn't be in violation? We could to solve this problem. Why don't we enlarge to the exemptions under 225-A to include subsection five, and that I believe would solve the problem. I'm good with that. I, I, I'm just bringing it up because I'm seeing that I, I didn't know how we were managing that part of it. So if we are doing that exemption, then is my understanding correct to go back to it? Let's say we add 2-25-5 to, to include the exemption that those establishments that are within 600 feet of a residential or a hospital as set forth in 225-5 would need to apply for and be approved by the village to have a, a permit or some type of application to approve that outdoor event. Yes. That's okay. section eight. What, uh, what we're, we're including that to be the exemptions that were applied then to 225-5. But if this, and I don't, excuse my naivete, I just don't know. Um, does Newman's get a license at the beginning of the year to be able to play outdoor events? Yeah, they get a license every for each event for each event. Okay, it's not like an annual license where do they do that now? Yeah. Okay, so like their parking lot parties and stuff they get. So that's not an additional staff process. That's what the only, that was my only concern. No, it's just a special event, just like uh, excuse me, just like in Creek or um, any other special shut down. Mm -hmm. Holiday on state. Right. Holiday. I was just concerned with adding that and then making the businesses obtain approval if that was going to be an additional staff process. So we're doing that anyway. So adding so and, uh, well, you and I are aware that there are there is a potential of another business coming in time once you do this three nights a week without no sound. So you should sure. keep that in mind. Well that won't be a special event. I think we'll figure that out when we get there, but we need to write the ordinance for now. Right. Well, well I just I, to, to that point, Mr. President, I, we're going to have to figure it out before they can do anything then, because unless there Correct. is some type of process for that, they would be in violation. Correct. But then at least it's not like a free for all. I mean, we're we're yeah, kind of. It does concern me a little bit when we're recruiting, working with business coming into town. Do we have to say, oh, when you, if you come to town, we'll change your ordinance? No, I don't necessarily. Okay. I understand. 
So where's what's the process look like then for this type of thing? I'm not really sure that we should limit that type of stuff. Um, because that's pretty prevalent with, uh, with new ones as well as could be somebody else coming mm -hmm. in. Is that something we could look into changing our liquor code to restrict? It could be it could be included, I would think. Yes, absolutely. Like that's how I normally see it. In some places, every time you have an outdoor event, and I just I can draw upon all the municipalities. I think it's helpful. In some localities or locations, you have every time you have an outdoor event, you come in and you apply. And in some it says you can have outdoor events Tuesday through uh, Tuesday through Sunday. As through the months of May through October, weather permitting. That's a municipality. Is that is that is that a year, is that a yearly permit or is that baked into the liquor license? Well, it's baked in the liquor license, which then in a way becomes a yearly permit, right? Because you get. So I guess I guess yeah. maybe that's my. So I think that that's probably the way we should approach it for the local businesses, because then this becomes a non-issue, and because then if you want to do something like out, you know, on a regular basis, then you've already applied for that in your license. The question is, is do we need to change this ordinance to refer back to the liquor license? Or let me just add real quick. We do the special event liquor license now allows two events per year, only two, two events per year. Understood. I just want everybody else to understand. Okay. Um, so if we if we could amend that category or we could create another category. I would think that we could just look at the liquor license that we classifications that we have now and maybe include some of the sound stuff in what we have going to address what we have already in the community, and then it becomes a non-issue unless the board Wants to handle it a different way. What if your business does not require you to have a liquor license and you still want to do that? Then you would get a then you would get a special event oh, permit like we already have. Okay. And that would address the types of businesses that have these on the regular. They would be a part of their liquor license. And then there's a, there's a, an avenue for anybody else. And then there's the protection for the residents that live in and around this. So when, I guess, when a business like Newman's gets a event license like that, how much do they pay? Uh, $50, I think, for one, for one event. I think, the, I think it's worth investigation, at least. Maybe we decide as a board that they just need to do the life, uh, the special events permit. But if there's a model that another community uses that incorporates it into license classifications, it might not. To your point about not having to change it or not having to get everything approved every time, we have a special right. event venue, if you will. Does a special <laughs> event permit require notification of uh, businesses and or residents within a certain distance of the one applying for that? I don't believe so. That's in our, that's in our um, block party regulations, but I don't believe it's something like special. I'm concerned just, just to be careful as we move forward. It's true. I hate to, to put it in something where they don't have to come back to us um, and they can, can be out there every single night. Yeah, we have no people. control. Yeah. Well, if, I, if I own a if I'm buying a liquor license and I'm paying twelve hundred a year, you're buying one for twelve hundred a year. Yeah. You're having six events, but we're both paying the same money. No, I understand that completely. But I'm saying that if there's a type of establishment that's looking would want to open in the village, that's more of an event venue versus a regular bar like we have, then I think it warrants the conversation of how do other towns do it. And so, like, if that's a concern of, you know, rather than changing the ordinance for everybody, maybe similar to what we did with the uh, gambling cafe on State Street, where we could create the classification and put further restrictions on it as well. So, you know, and so if we had a, an event venue or something like that that wants to come to town in order to sell liquor or have these type of events, here are the here's the rules that you need to follow. Kind of like when the gambling cafe came in. And we said you can't just be a bar where anybody can be in there. You have to be 21. I think we should pass this now and let our village manager and our uh, village attorney figure out whatever the heck you got to fill out for. I'm thinking that that's just the homework side of it, right? Like let's look into the rest of it. <clears throat> but I agree with Trustee Cole. Liquor license control Yes, and we'll make sure it will. And we'll also, whatever change we make in the liquor code, we'll make sure that it specifically calls out this one. And we have to come back and amend this thing. Absolutely. 100%. Okay, so just for cleaning up, um, the exceptions, we're going to add 25 or 2 25 2 as an exception. 
we're going to add in that same clause that it has to be audible indoors. And then in that 25-22-25-2, uh, we're going to add any electronic device that produce sound. No, it's it's actually 225-5. Okay. You keep saying two. And um, I, think, I apologize. I think yeah. all of them were supposed to be two. Five. Dash, it is five. five. It is five. I'm just reading my okay. notes here. So those are the proposed changes to the ordinance that's in front of you. I will in, uh, in, uh, entertain a motion to approve the ordinance with the changes we just spoke about. So moved. Second. Questions, comments, concerns? <laughs> Ms. Clerk, can you call the roll, please? Mr. Hoth? Aye. Ms. Palestrini? Aye. Mr. Robinson? Aye. Mr. Kelly? Aye. Motion passes 4 0. Thank you. With that, Mr. Mayor, we ask your consideration of the resolution to waive bidding requirements and accepting a quote from AFCON for surge protection devices in the thickening building of the wastewater treatment plant in the amount of $45,900. We have an agenda supplement in your packet from Ms. Lyons. Uh, I really wanted you to walk through this just briefly. Mr. Edges, can you open the door? I think you're in the hallway. Um. So VAPCON is um, a vendor that we've been using for many years and provides a lot of um, electronic systems to um, protect our various uh, water and wastewater facilities. And um, so the quote is from them and um, it is over $25,000. So we're requesting you waive the formal bidding requirements and um, this is a little bit more than the amount that was budgeted. However, uh, we're monitoring the amount spent in that line item, and we still have funds available there. So. The only thing I'd like to add is that surge protection is a real high priority because we're obviously protecting our equipment. We had, did not have, but still don't have as much as we should. So this is a real high priority for us. Is this the company that added all the stuff and comment was screwing us on uh, Harmony Road at the water treatment? Um, they have done all the work on our certification. So to go to another vendor would create another mess. Well, these guys are familiar with our... Well, that's what I'm saying. They know our system. That's what yep. I'm saying. Like, yep. it's a very specialized type of equipment based on our systems. That's why I'm asking. Does anyone have any questions for Ms. Lyons uh, or Mr. Hedges or Mr. Cole? I just, I have... I'm just I, I'm fine with all of the stuff and, and the purchase and the uh, uh, waiving of the bid. I'm just trying to come to terms with uh, the budget includes more than 165,000 for surge protection. Mm -hmm. So starting with that, we're, we've got 45,900 here. That leaves 119,100, but yet it's saying that there'll be 49,935 remaining. So we have already spent on other projects smaller okay. projects okay um for surge protection this year to date so that's why there's only that 49.9 yes okay then yeah. they have everything yeah. else in there okay. i just wanted to assure you that despite spending five thousand dollars more than we had budgeted there still is money remaining so yeah. okay i'm good anyone have any other questions for mrs lyons I'll entertain a motion to uh, approve a resolution to waive the bidding requirements and accepting a quote from BAPCOM for search protection devices. So moved. Second. Questions, comments, concerns? Ms. Clerk, can you call the roll, please? Ms. Downstreet? Aye. Mr. Robinson? Aye. Mr. Kelly? Aye. Mr. Cole? Aye. Motion passes 4 0. Next, we have some staff reports here. You'll see in your packet we have the financial report, we have the building report, and we have the streets report. I will ask you to review those at this time, and if there are any questions, staff is available for conversation. I have I a have question. Financial report. Sorry, go ahead, Trustee Paulus. You, you go right ahead. <laughs> There's a um, On the um, revenue side, I know that these reports, because they're still in the current ERP system, automatically do the even division across 12 months when they look at year-to-date budget. So I know we take that with a grain of salt. So if we look at total village income, sorry, this is on page 21 of the packet. If we look at total pay, uh, total village revenue of 9.2 million, and we've got a budget of 12.8 million. Um, Ms. Lyons, how are we on target as far as hitting the 12.8? Are we expecting additional, uh, what, 3.6 million in revenue coming in? Are we expected to 
to to be over what's where where are you seeing us by the end of this year estimation wise so there are a couple things that um may not happen that are large yeah. that i can think of for instance um the uh rin and park stormwater uh, project is in this budget um i believe that that total is around seven seven hundred thousand for the rin and park yes seven fifty yeah seven fifty <clears throat> um it's all you know a matter of timing if we don't believe it's going to happen by april 30th which i highly doubt um, we'll be putting um, that item back in the budget for next year. So there are some known items that will not will not happen. Um, but generally, um, yeah. Okay. So that's for revenue. We wouldn't receive yeah. the grant money. And you're saying there there are known items. Are there any other larger known items that we know are not coming in? And and what would those be? So that's the biggest item that I can think of. Um, what about the safe routes to school grant? We don't know where we're getting that, do we? Yeah, that will not be an issue. Yeah. yeah so yeah. the safe routes to school, the Illinois, the state contribution or the grant that we want for that doesn't sound like we're going to get that this year either. That's a substantial amount of money as well. Yeah, but was that in our budget as yes. revenue? The engineering was definitely in, and I believe that the construction was in as well. Yeah, it was talked about that it would be completed by the summer of this year, and it's not. We haven't even, they haven't even talked about it. Hmm. It's one of those things that the state says, sure, you can have the money when we want to give it to you. <laughs> okay, so are we, do we receive additional um, property tax revenue between now and the end of the fiscal? No, we're over budget on that. I always budget a little bit, you know, like, 95% of our expected levy versus um, actual dollar for dollar. So, but no, that's, we won't. that's what I thought. I just, I, the only reason why I'm bringing it up and asking the question is I know we talked about the fact that we currently are on track to have a pretty healthy surplus this year. Um, but when I look at the total revenue for the village in a $3.6 million gap between now, not gap as in we're not going to get it, but $3.6 million delta between the year to date actual and where we budgeted to be on April 30th, right? April 30th, 24. So in like two and a half months, um, if the streets or the safe route to school and the park and rent grant, you know, even if that makes up 1.5 million, which I'm just throwing crazy numbers out there. I don't know what it adds up to. That's still a pretty healthy delta, and I'm just wondering where we're estimating that kind of revenue comes from if we're not getting additional property taxes. Um, I, honestly, you're kind of catching me off guard. I mean, I know about that uh, the Rin and Park thing is a, is a large item that I'm, I know that, you know, is definitely contributing to that dollar amount. I'll have to get back to you with respect okay, to- Okay, so I guess I can word it differently too, Ms. Lyons, and okay. I didn't mean to catch you off guard on this. Do you have any concerns of us, take out the the large one for Park and Wren, do you have any concerns of us coming into being close to what we thought we would have as far as revenue minus the two grants that we don't know, or we feel we're not gonna get? Can I simplify that to say, do you think that we're no, we're no longer going to have a healthy surplus. We'll have a deficit. Is that what you're asking? <laughs> no, I'm it. asking. I'm asking if if our revenue, if our income, is going to come in at what we thought the budget would be, when you take out those two items. So if our if our budget's twelve eight, and you take out those two items, that gives us a new budgeted amount because now we're saying we know they won't come in. So whatever that delta is, take those things out as if they were never in the budget. Do you feel or have confidence that the village is going to generate the revenue that we had thought that it was going to generate this fiscal. Mr. Kellen, can I try this? <clears throat> um, the, the, the typical revenues from sales tax, income tax, local government distributed fund, all those, all those uh, projections, I believe, I believe Lori and I would agree that those are on schedule or maybe ahead of schedule. Um, if we take out the revenue and the expenditures, for the, for the grant is six hundred fifty thousand. Excuse me, seven hundred fifty thousand dollars. Yes, our total revenue will go down, but that doesn't impact the forecast for the other funds. Does that make sense? 
No, I, mm -hmm. I understand that part. And that's what I was asking was, even when you take those out and you take it out of the budget and you take it out of the actual, are we feeling that we're on target for every other revenue stream that we were estimating? Because there was discussion over the past couple of meetings where we felt we were going to have pretty healthy fund balances. So when we go over on things like potentially going over budget for the surge protection, um, I will only speak for myself. It makes it easier to approve those type of things, knowing that we were budgeting a surplus because we were um, there was more revenue coming in because there was more building than had been estimated. There was more property tax than had been estimated. So that's what I'm trying to figure out if we are still thinking we could end up where ahead of where we thought we were if you take those grants out. Mr. Kelly, I, I don't believe we um, ever indicated that um, the revenue streams that Laurie's forecasted in the budget are still still expected uh, to meet the budget. So no, we're not, but what I really want to say is that um, I don't believe we, we have actually asked you to overspend in any line item. What Laurie explained earlier is that we're overspending for surge protection, but in that particular line item, we're still in the budget. So we haven't, if we ask you to spend over budget, we'll make a point to say that, and we haven't done that yet. So our regular revenue as budgeted should be adequate. And yes, I, I do believe personally, I think Laurie might as well, that some of our revenue streams will come in at a budget, but we're not counting on that. Okay, thank you. If I could just jump on top of that, because, you know, it was last month or the month before when we added some things for the public works that needed it. They were items that were not planned for, for maybe the next budget year, the next budget year. And then we did approve those. And I think that's what Trustee Kelly is, is kind of thinking about, is that we approved some of those knowing that we needed them. But they weren't in this budget year. They were in another budget year that was expected down the road. And so we approved them knowing that we had surplus. So I think a, an item that I think you're thinking of yeah. is the snowplow. We had the opportunity to buy a snowplow. No. The, when that works, water. The 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 yeah, I'm not going to know what all of them were. Was the the water department. Yeah. Yeah. So then I apologize. Water department did that. Um, so if we, in the case of the enterprise funds that kind of stand alone, despite being in this $12 million overall budget, um, we will make sure that in total, they're even keeled. So if we authorize media replacement for $150,000, we will take it out of someplace else. We won't overspend by $150,000 in that fund. So, okay. Is that good for you, Trustee Kelly? Yeah, I'm good for now, thanks. I have three questions. Okay, I'll just go through. Um, and ours are our packets are numbered, so yeah. I'm going to go with the first page of the um, of your report. Okay. Um, at the very bottom, the pension trust fund, and I'm just a little concerned with the fact that seven months ended, we had year to date budgeted four hundred forty eight thousand six forty nine, and actual was one sixty two three ninety four. So um, we've had some withdrawals from the pension fund. And um, when I budget for withdrawals, all I do is look at last year, at year end, who has funds remaining that has, has the ability to withdraw. And I budget for that dollar amount. I don't project that we're going to lose police officers, uh, additional police officers that will withdraw. Okay. So that's that's the main difference there. Okay, so that's what pulled out extra money we were in. Yes, that and um, uh, we have had a disability um, claim, and so the, it's the village's pension fund obligation to obtain independent medical evaluations of the individual that is claiming uh, disability. And so those were... Um, more expensive than projected. So, yeah. Um, on the positive side, um, mm -hmm. the fund is doing a little bit better on the investment side right now. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there are some offsets. And, and all the investments are doing phenomenally. So that was a, 
very positive thing about the poll. Um, on page two of uh, the report, um, you can just list the fund at the very top of the page and the one at the bottom. Of the, yeah, so the very top of the page would be general fund revenues 01. Is that the very the top black box? Mm -hmm. Okay, that helps when, when we're looking at the okay. 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 That's okay. The, the, the second general fund expense for 01 then, um, my concern was the contractual services. On, on both that one for administration as well as for um, the streets department. And I just didn't know what the contractual services were, especially with the administration one that was budgeted for 374 or 526 and ended up year to date so far as 554. And I think um, and I think I didn't mean to do I didn't mean to do street department. I meant to do police department for contractual services. And I know we've had some contractual services, and that one um, for police we thought was 203902, and it's in essence 26044. So the police one I can speak to right off the bat. Okay. Um, that is uh, legal and other professional services. Um, okay. Yeah. And that is not included then in the one for administration. Um, so that's not included in the one for administration. No, they're completely separate. We, okay. we charge expenses by department. Um, so any legal expenses that were incurred for police matters <coughs> were reported in the police department. Okay, so then for the administration, we're... we're uh, let me look that up for you. Um, yes, it's, it's way over. Let me figure out what exactly is included in that that's causing that to go over. So... Um, you mentioned that it was uh, legal services. Is that when when you look at this tabulation, does this include what's billed back to the developer, or is this just no, total cost? It does not include any of that. Okay, so okay, that's just what. And, I, and it was police that I was speaking specifically with respect. No, to. I'm talking about like an administration. Let's say like legal is included, or some other other like engineering or something sure. of that nature, because that would be lumped in there too. When we look at this tabulation that does not speak to what's billed back to the developer. This is just total amounts, period. They're village responsibilities. They would not be developer responsibilities. Okay. So this is just, okay, perfect. If we can come back to this, I'll get you that information. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay. On page five of the report, then, under... Um, uh, public use fees, 06, mm -hmm. and uh, the impact fees, uh, transportation impact fees, just below it. My concern was with the license fines and permit fees that had come in, and, and it's under revenue, so that's always a positive thing anyway, but it's like almost three times the amount that we expected for license fines, permit fees for public use, as well as for transportation. So those are related to new home uh, permits that okay. we receive impact fees for. Okay. Um, those are village impact fees, both public use and transportation. Um, those, I mean, we had 291 building permits that were applied for and paid for in 2000. Uh, that's calendar year, um, 2023. That is three times what I projected. Okay. To, yeah, so. <coughs> transportation fees are caught up in that too? Yep. They are? Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep, okay. So that's, those are my own questions. Okay. And I'll get back to you in just a moment. Thank you. Yep. Any other questions? On the building report or streets report? Thank you, Ms. Lyons. Thank you, Mr. Khan, for the building report. Thank you, Public Works, for the streets report. Mm -hmm. I guess we're going to use the streets report. No one's no, no. here from Public Works, so we'll thank Trustee Cole. <laughs> um, next, you'll have the accounts payable to personnel um, in the amount of, I've got all my paperwork here. Here it is. Okay, thank you. Uh, $159.82. Do you have any questions about the 182? I'll entertain a motion to pay the accounts payable to personnel in the amount of $100. $159.82. Questions, comments, concerns? Need a second. Oh, I need a second. Second. Thank you. 
Uh, questions, comments, concerns? Ms. Clerk, can you call the roll, please? Mr. Robinson? Aye. Mr. Kelly? Aye. Mr. Cove? Aye. Ms. Palestrini? Aye. Motion passed 4 0. Okay, next you have the uh, regular accounts payable in the amount of $370,201.93. I have two questions. Page 15. Page 15. Bottom of the page. 15. Bottom of the page. Five grand or near five grand for paid legal services. What kind of legal services? Hang on, just a second. This is Passarelli. This is uh, for the, our, our union and police attorney. Yeah, labor, okay. labor matters. And then uh, the next page, page 16, second from the bottom. I guess I should have asked Dave. Replace battery, $403. Is that for one of the big trucks, I hope? It's a police department expense. <clears throat> kind of battery we buy it for $400. I'd like to have one. Well, <laughs> I don't know what's installed. It's a rate. I, I talked to Jim about that. I remember what it was. There was a reason, but I, I it can't be a car battery. I can get back there. Well, no, it's a car. It's it is, but it's I, one of the Durangos. There's two of them you replace. There was a reason. I can't remember what it was. I can get back to it. I know that uh, when I looked to replace the battery, my wife said it was like 300 bucks because there's two batteries, one for the car and one for the start stop. Installation, right? I do my own installation. <laughs> I, I figured that. <laughs> that probably is just a battery. So we'll, we'll confirm it to you. Yeah. Any other questions? I'll entertain a motion to approve the accounts payable in uh, $370,201.93. So moved. Second. Questions, comments, concerns? This question you go over, please. Mr. Kelly? Aye. Mr. Cole? Aye. Ms. Powell Strange? Aye. Mr. Robinson? Aye. Mr. Kess zero. All right. Um, Next, uh, we have some new business, and it, it seems that there's an attorney update. So we'll put there's a look. Oh. Mr. Vaselli on the stand. Thank you. Uh, so I have been in conversation with the attorney, Scott Richmond, who represents EEI with regard to their standard contract. You remember a couple meetings ago, there was some confusion about some of the standard terms. I'm waiting to hear back from him. Um, I did speak to his client um, on Friday morning, and he said that he'd authorized Mr. Richmond to send me back a document with revisions. The two major revisions that we talked about, and this is stems from the conversations that we had with regard to their standard form contract, was adding language that ensures that in all instances, the specific scope of their work supersedes any of the terms and conditions. You remember? When we talked about their contract, it was the determined condition seems as though the exception wherein would take out and not control for the actual review of work that they were doing. So he agreed with me. He said that it was a change long overdue. So he was going to recommend that his client. I believe that they are on board with that. And the second big change that we talked about was environmental. If you remember when we talked about the terms and conditions previously, they would just stop and report to us when they were environmental. Um, he was very amenable to it, as was his client when I spoke to him, that they would cooperate with us to find a solution with regards to environmental. So it's not just the work that stops, but we're going to work together. They've been the village engineer almost for as long as there's been a village, is my understanding. <laughs> so they know that there's a trust back in the relationship there. I look forward to presenting to you a, these two changes and any other changes that we talked about. Um, at one of the upcoming meetings after I get back to it from him. So thank you, Mr. President. One question, Mr. Vitali. Yes. For the, the contract itself then, I mean, I didn't look at the date. Did it end already or we're we just doing this ahead of time or is there... Prospectively. Still a, okay, so there's a contract that's still in place. Correct. So okay, I, I assume that's what I asked. For cost and time efficiencies, I want to make sure that we're comfortable with the EI contract going forward because they'll attach the standard form contract. And remember, it was a it was a unique contract. I think the last time it was more of a soft services rather than a hard construction um, uh, or production of documents services. So I want to make sure it covers both. And I mentioned that to him. I said you can't just have one 
cookie cutter contract for these things. As you know, and he agreed. And so I think we're going to have a good product by the time we're done going through it. So thank you, Trustee. Thank you. Any other questions about the attorney update? I have an uh, update on the attorney. Uh, it was his birthday this week, and he <laughs> turned 50. And while, at, and while I've heard that other boards have sung happy birthday to him, I am not going to do that. <laughs> so, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Stop say again. We have a silly hat around here. Oh, we could make him. We could, we could make him wear a silly hat. But anyway, I'd like to wish you a happy birthday. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any other uh, new business or other announcements? Can we circle back to the contractual services? Oh, oh man, bring the best down. Really quickly. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so the biggest difference is about a hundred thousand dollars, hundred and five thousand dollars in um, building inspection services. And then uh, the only other line item that is currently over budget compared to where we should be, okay. you know, like at this year to date, is um, legal services. So, okay. yep. Thank you. All right. Uh, maybe I should take back the happy birthday. No, I'm kidding. Yeah. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, any other announcements tonight? Maybe reports. Uh, you know, we could. I, don't know if I skipped right. over it. I, I skipped over it. Do we have any committee reports this evening that anybody wants to present? BDC. Trustee Kelly? I don't think yeah. you were at the meeting. Yes, I was at the BDC meeting. Would um, you like to talk about it? The BDC met, I'll actually report on both of my committees. Um, the BDC met yesterday, um, and the discussion was that there was a couple of things discussed. One was the current status of projects for approved uh, facade grants. And there are some that are looking like because of weather, they may not be finished before the end of this fiscal. So at some point, there may need to be a discussion with the board on how that affects next year's fiscal budget. Um, I know that the there will be conversations with those businesses that may have that delay in having them send something to the village board to explain the delay. Um, there is, it was also discussed that within the program rules, it does state, state that all work needs to be done within six months of the approval of the project or the grant application. Uh, and so there were, to our recollection, none of the current projects were approved uh, less than six months from the end of our fiscal year. Um, so technically they should all be done if they're going to be eligible. However, there are extenuating circumstances that may require that they um, come to send something to the board for an extension, which then may put it into the next fiscal year. Um, and there was also discussion then because the application states that they agree to follow all of the rules and regulations as outlined within the details of the facade grant program. But on the application itself, it doesn't, they're not signing to any time other than it references those rules and regulations, which then that's where the time period is at. So the, the committee discussed having that specifically added. Um, into the language of where they're physically signing so that it's it's upfront and evident to them and not a while it's still uh a true statement to say that they are notified of this timing it makes it um a little bit more upfront for them so that was one of the discussions any questions on that one okay there was also discussions on those that have either expressed interest or um are in the process of putting together an application that would be a part of next fiscal year um, and the BDC's desire to have the facade program still included or considered for inclusion in the budget because there is pretty strong interest from the community for a variety of projects, especially from those that have never applied before. Um, and so I am relaying that message to the board as well. Any questions on that? Yes. Didn't we talk at the last meeting or the meeting before or the last two meetings about next year's uh, grant money not being available and we were going to use it in-house? 
Yeah, it was one of the discussions that we've had about if we have to find revenue or if we have to find funding for some of these capital projects, is that one of the things that we consider ending so that it can go towards the capital projects? And I think that will be one of the discussions when staff presents their options for revenue to help cover capital expenditures in our first budget committee meeting. But you are absolutely accurate, Trustee Coat. That is one of the things that we discussed that would potentially need to be cut. I think we discussed that. We discussed things like funding concrete days, things like that. Any other questions for BDC? No, sir. Okay. Um, Oh, wait, is budget next? I, I don't have the note in front of me. Yeah, yeah. budget's next. Uh, the budget committee update. Budget committee is meeting next Wednesday, oh. the 21st. Uh, it is a committee of the whole, so the entire board is uh, invited to attend. It is at 6.30 at Village Hall. Uh, and its focus will be the capital expenditures as presented by staff, as well as their options for consideration on um, paths to revenue or how to uh, fund the capital projects that uh, that have been identified and needed. So that will be the focus for the meeting on the 21st. Any questions? I wanted to let everybody know that there is a uh, police pension mm -hmm. board meeting held in this um, room that same evening from five until they're done, but it, their meetings are generally less than so there should not be a conflict at all. Um, but you might not want to come 45 minutes early. <laughs> Welcome, but you'll be in a pension meeting, which would be kind of fun. <laughs> a little different. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Trustee Kelly. Thank you, board. Thank you, staff. Motion to adjourn. So moved. Okay. Questions, comments, concerns? Ms. Clark, can you call roll, please? Mr. Cole. Aye. Ms. Palestrini? Aye. Mr. Robinson? Aye. Mr. Kelly? Aye. Thank you. Thank you.